Ladies and gentlemen, as we return from our networking break, um, we are set to embark on the fi final panel discussion of the forum, a segment dedicated to the ever-evolving world of technology. This panel promises to explore on the cutting-edge advancement and pivotal challenges in AI and machine learning. To lead us into this conversation, we are honored to have Dr. John Langford, a distinguished computer scientist and partner researcher manager at Microsoft. Dr. Langford's work in machine learning, learning theory, and his contributions to various algorithms and applications in AI have marked a significant milestone in the field. He will be delivering a keynote speech entitled, The Promise of AI for Shared Prosperity, Opportunities and Risk, offering us a glimpse into the transformative potential and ethical consideration of AI technologies. Please welcome. Thank you. Let's see. Oh, yeah. All right, you guys hear me well? Great. All right, so um, I'm in machine learning. I've been working in that field for 20 years or so. And the last year has been a lot of fun. Uh, things have, have changed radically. Uh, and it's really GPT-4, which I think really opened people's eyes to what was going on. There were already, I think, revolutions underway in, in various ways. Um, I think it was about a little over a decade ago that people started, started to realize they could do much better than hidden Markov models with speech recognition. And then they realized they could do much better than this kind of sort of feature engineering with image recognition. And then they realized that they could uh, do much better than uh, sort of the, the deep blue style uh, alpha beta search for uh, playing Go. And then the deep reinforcement learning came along. And then these transformers came along and the transformers are actually very interesting. Um, and I, I want to give you kind of a, I, I haven't been working directly on them, but I want to give you kind of my semi-informed understanding of them. So transformers are an architecture which is very good at absorbing uh, potentially very large amounts of inf information. There's a sequential prediction architecture. So they learn to imitate behaviors, essentially. And words, I think, are, are the cleanest and nicest form of behavior in a lot of ways, which is why we see the, the big revolution in, uh, with, with words, with GPT-4, with, with these chat agents. So the ability to learn to predict language extremely well, better than probably Shannon predicted what is even possible, uh, is revolutionary. And it sets things up so that with just a little bit of extra post-training, you can actually get chat agents that uh, behave like they're people or, or like there's some sort of intelligence there, which is amazing. Um, so I'll, I'll get into some of their weaknesses just so you understand a little bit later, but I, I want you to think of this as not just language because it's, it's not gonna be just language. I, there's already many instances of, of generative AI applying in other domains. So. Um, there's image recognition, uh, or not recognition, but image generation, uh, where, where there's fantastic things happening. You can go and get one of these uh, uh, programs and, and you can do art. That's kind of cool. Um, there's fascinating things happening in robotics, actually. Um, I was at NeurIPS, uh, one of the conferences in the area, uh, in December, uh, and Russ Tedrick was talking about what's going on at Toyota Research Institute. They can give about 100 examples. They can just show a robot how to do something about 100 times, and it learns how to do it. And it works for all kinds of, of, of relatively simple skill tasks of one sort or another. And then you can start chaining these together, and you can, uh, you can abstract them, and you can, you can use GPT-4 to actually start to choose. And you see uh, papers about this, like, uh, I forget. There's one coming out of Google, which is quite a bit of fun. So there's a lot of capabilities around this which are growing and which are going to have a big impact in the future. Um, so I think it's very common for, for scientists to say, oh, this is going to really matter, but I think this is really going to matter. Like, honestly, I think this is going to matter. Um, and I think this is just starting. If you look at the sequence of revolutions that we had in the last um, decade and a half, 
I think they're going to continue. There's going to be new things. Is headroom to grow. Let me tell you one example of headroom to grow. If you ask in a person's lifetime how many language tokens do they encounter, it's kind of the basic unit in these transformer models, it's maybe a billion. Uh, that is tiny compared to the data sets they're training with right now. And that says that there's vast room to improve in sort of the core architectures which are being used. Transformers are perhaps the first model which uh, has a flexibility to absorb large amounts of information, but there are presumably better models to be, uh, that out there to discover which can do things much faster and much better. Another key thing which um, is kind of a, a missing capability that we expect of what we think of as intelligence is these, these models kind of on their own don't learn. Um, they require extra support in order to do any kind of learning. So there's, they're, they're very good at this in some ways. So there's this notion of in-context learning where you, you add in a little bit of extra information into the context and then learn from that. Uh, but that has limitations. Context can't be too large. Uh, and you would really like something that can learn like a person does, right? How do you create a system where you can just, it can continue to improve constantly over time? So these kinds of, these are the kinds of the research thoughts that the people are thinking about right now. Uh, and uh, I'm excited in some of these directions myself. Okay, so I, I don't want to go into details because this is not the right place for that, but um, I do think it's, it's worthwhile to kind of draw out some of the implications of what's going on here because I think it, it has effects at a society level and, uh, and you're going to be seeing them play out over the next decade. All right, so one thing is repetitive digital work is not something that you want to be investing in. Um, repetitive dig digital work is something where um, these systems are just going to be able to crush it. Uh, and it, you can already see this happening in, in many ways. Uh, there's this uh, GitHub Copilot. I, I work with many engineers at Microsoft and uh, they use GitHub Copilot all the time. It makes things easy because Particularly if you're dealing with like a, a library or a, a, maybe a, a bit of language that you're not familiar with, it has all the idioms already down. And then you're just trying to fill in the, the, like the semantically meaningful parts of things. And so they just get stuff, more stuff done. Um, <clears throat> if you think about digitizable work, things which, will, are, will be, are, which could be digitized in the future, I think that, that that's coming. So I, was, uh, I won a long bet, a 10-year bet, around self-driving cars uh, a couple of years ago. But I'm not going to take the same bet again. Um, I think that uh, these kinds of techniques actually can create a pretty powerful, pretty capable self-driving car. Uh, OK, so, so that's interesting. Um, th there's, uh, there's downsides that we can think about here, too. And I, I want to dwell on one of those because I'm sure we'll encounter more of it in the near future, which is, um, which is sort of how do you know what reality is? All right, so there's your immediate environment, and that's not going to really change, but what's going on in the world, you're really learning through digital media. And um, that digital media is subject to fabrication in ways that did not exist previously. So people. I uh, have uh, paranoid stories about some things being fabricated in the past, but we didn't have the tech to do that. Now the tech is actually developing to do that. And it's easy to imagine that this will happen. I mean, it's not like elections are, you know, uh, gentlemanly uh, affairs. It, it, it's more like people do whatever they can for their side to win in many situations. Um, the ethics here can become very questionable. And there's substantial danger that uh, things kind of fly apart and people just believe alternate realities that don't really exist, but they're synthesized for them. And then how would they even get the feedback to know that they're wrong? It's not like they're going to Washington, D.C. Uh, to learn things. They just they get their things from their news source. So I, I think what I'm trying to say is I, I feel like reality needs hardening. Uh, in the future, um, and even in the present. Uh, 
what's really happening matters. And if somebody can convince you that uh, of some sort of alternate reality, then they can sell you things. They can make you do almost anything, actually. Uh, my brother lives in a community called Klamath Falls, where um, a rumor started going around that um, uh, Antifa was coming. And a whole bunch of people showed up with guns downtown to uh, repel the Antifa invasion. This is not a joke, this is real. Um, there's, um, I mean, if people can manipulate your reality, they can make you do almost anything. You should think about that because it, it, it could really matter. Now let's switch back to something positive. It's well known that in education, a personal tutor is very powerful for improving the outcomes of education. Right now, people are fooling with personal tutors built upon these chatbots. They're not yet good enough. But there is a real chance that, that these things can become good enough. It's not like, I mean, th these systems are good enough to uh, kind of handle um, things up through maybe middle school math in many situations. And uh, sometimes they, they provide evidence they can go much further in narrow ways. That could grow substantially. Um, there's a there's a particular weakness to these models, which is they have a they're a circuit. The circuit has a finite depth. You can't if, if it's something which requires a search, it can't really uh, do that search unless that it, it, unless it's simulatable inside of that circuit depth. All right. So um, getting around that is a topic of a very active research right now. Um, there's uh, a bunch of open source tools trying to create uh, loopy computations around these, uh, the, these, these chatbots. Um, and they often can actually do much better than the, the, the base chatbot just by invoking it multiple times, asking it to correct, uh, and, and things like that. Okay, so, um, so that's, that's one of the limits. I want, there's a couple other limits that I wanted to mention, just so you have a bit more feel for things. Um, there's a, the tendency, I think, which is a little bit harder to describe, for the context of a chatbot to kind of fray. Um, this, this, is a, this is a little bit hard to describe, but let me kind of uh, try. Um, if you're talking to a real person, they're building up some state in their head about you. And they're kind of you're kind of understanding them, and, and they're understanding you. And, and the process of chatting with somebody is, is a process of, of kind of modeling the other person effectively, and growing that model over time, maybe even over years, uh, as you get to know somebody better and better. If you work with these chatbots, it doesn't work like that because if you ask them to do a task and it's something which has to do with something loopy, then they go and they do a loopy computation. But the, something goes wrong in that loopy computation, and that gets thrown into the context, and then, then that causes more things to go wrong, and it kind of cascades. And so they, they're, 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 it's tricky to do sort of complex, multi-minute tasks with these things. Sometimes it's possible for, for particular things, but, but there's kind of this um, loss of context which can easily occur uh, when you're trying to do, use these systems for, uh, for more complex tasks. And then the other thing to think about a lot is undigitized behaviors. So um, one that I was thinking about recently was um, throwing a ball, right? So if you're going to throw a ball, there's, it's hard to describe how you're going to throw a ball. Um, it, 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 there's muscle groups involved and things like that. And, and GPT-4 knows the muscle groups, and it knows you need to fire them. But it can't specify the firing pattern in an effective fashion because it's, uh, it's, it's sort of not experienced it in its, in, in its input data set. Right? So its input data set is, you know, text on the internet to a large extent. Uh, and there's no recordings of this. So there's lots of behaviors which are not really recorded on the internet in an effective fashion or not in an accessible fashion yet. So video things are not that accessible yet. Um, and because of that, these systems just don't know how to behave when they thr thrust into these domains. Okay, so now that's kind of 
some of the things that are, I think are promising and features of the future, and some of the limitations. And now I, I hear a lot of discussions about policy, and, and I want to kind of give you some thoughts to start with as far as policy. So first of all, there's a policy about, about trying to control these systems in various ways. So you control access, or you, you limit them, you, you try to avoid misuse of these. I think these are probably good policies, honestly, because there's, there's ways these things can go wrong. But I want you to think of them not as a solution, but rather as a grace period, where we try to figure out how to deal with misuse of these systems. Because it's almost inevitable that now that people know, know it's possible, it becomes 10 times easier, and it's getting, it'll be another 10 times easier in a couple of years. There's more and more compute becoming available. There's more and more possibilities for people to create the models on their own. Uh, information about these models leaks out, the best way to train them. There's lots of all kinds of tweaks. There are people in my lab who have figured out how to improve the training process in various ways. Uh, so it's just going to get easier and easier for, for people to do this. And so you should assume in the future that a spammer will have full access to these models. And we should be thinking about what we're going to do in that kind of situation. Um, or we should think about any kind of actor having access to these models, what we're going to do in that kind of situation. Because these policies, are they, they give us some time to, to work on things, but we should be working on them. Um, there's a question of compensation that comes up. Uh, and uh, I guess the point here is that people worked hard to create news articles for the New York Times. Um, I, I can understand that. Um, and, and then GPT-4 swallows all these news articles and now can create news articles or news article-like things very well. Uh, I think there's, there's a real point here. But I don't think it's a solution to the economic issues in the long term. And I think a good analogy here is the longshoreman. So uh, if you go containerized uh, shipping has changed the world. Um, I went to Singapore. I looked at the port there. It was amazing. It's like this giant sorting machine. Um, <clears throat> the number of people who are actually involved in moving things on and off ships has declined precipitously. Now, uh, there's unions for these, and they actually get paid quite well. That's great. But it's still a very small number of people who are making a living as longshoremen compared to previous. And I kind of feel like it's, it's that kind of way for even if there's a good compensation model, you're going to run into this kind of situation where these, the, the training of these models requires some good content, but um, it, it, it may not be the case that everyone everywhere gets compensated well. And it, it, it's, it's tricky to figure out these compensation issues. I do worry a lot about fabrication, as we talked about earlier, about alternate realities. It's getting more and more possible to just sustain an alternate reality indefinitely. Um, I, I wonder policy-wise if we should have some way to disincentivize things. If somebody can make you believe crazy things so that you buy their survival gadget, you know, um, it's really not in their interest to do this. And there's many other situations where, at a policy level, we, we don't allow things which are not in people's interest. Like, you cannot sign a contract to become a slave. It's not allowed. Um, <clears throat> drones. Drones, I think, when these things hit drones, it's, it's scary. I mean, I watch what happens in, in, uh, with the war uh, in, uh, between Russia and Ukraine. The drones there are completely changing the way the war is fought. And they're not even using this kind of approach yet. They could. Uh, it's not hard to imagine. Um, if the US was directly involved in this war, it would probably start begin beginning to happen about now. Um, because the, the, the tech is there. Um, and it's, it's probably going to be there in, in Ukraine very shortly. Uh, and then once you do that, a whole class of anti-drone defenses around trying to interrupt the uh, Wi-Fi connections or the wireless connections doesn't work anymore at all. And so we need to be thinking seriously about how we're going to have a society that can cope with uh, drone warfare. Um, and this might seem alarmist, but I want you to think about the internet, right? And the internet, because there is anonymity, People 
can do some pretty arbitrary and nasty things. With drones, because there is an anonymity, people can do some pretty arbitrary and nasty things. Um, and then I, I think in the long term, with the development of AI, I, 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 there's this trend towards, I think, needing more education in order to be a kind of a productive member of society. And while we may be able to assist people greatly with education, I, I feel like there's a, a long-term discussion and thinking to be had around what is a society where you need to have a PhD level education uh, in the future to, to kind of be a productive member? What is that going to look like? How, how is that going to work well? Because, uh, I mean, the honest truth is I, I grew up in, in small town Oregon where um, almost nobody got a PhD. Um, I was the first person in my family, in my family history, to ever get a PhD. And it, I don't know what's going to happen to society uh, when that happens. Anyway, uh, I, I don't want to depress you. I think there are great things to be had. I think there are great debates to be had. And I think there should be some serious thought put into uh, where these things develop in the future. All right. That is uh, all I have to say. Thank you.